to see. We all want to be real. All right. Hello. All right. Finally. That sounds crispier. <laughs> <laughs> Come together, finally. Great. Yes. All right, so uh, I'm just making some final notes here. So, you know, whatever was going on astrologically was pretty turbulent, which I think we saw the remainder of that within the next week. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. uh, and also I was in a, a real transition period with what I know to be going on and, you know, how that's impacting and affecting us. And so I was actually still in the middle of that ingestion of, of knowledge. So mm -hmm. now that I'm over that hump, and, you know, definitely I've stabilized more within the last 48 hours even. Um, it, I think it'd be a good time to really come at this with a, a really clear picture of what everyone needs to know. And, you know, the real, the real um, let's say, foreground to the story of today or the show of today is just really to start cutting through a lot of the emotional aspects and... Also, just the tissue, you know, just putting gloves on all the time when dealing with people about these situations because time's definitely running out. And I like to keep people in a position to to really have the leisure to some extent to ponder this and to make the decisions. But I also think at this point it's going to be an extreme injustice if we keep handling things that way this late in the game. Seeing that, you know, I, I know you guys have been on for years now, and obviously I've been doing the message for years and still, to me, the overall status of the community, not so much as the people that are just starting to figure out what we know, but the community at large is really uh, in disarray. And so I would really like to address some of the more prime suspects, if you may, and targets uh, in this whole thing that we're dealing with when, uh, you know, getting ourselves free from Earth's dominion and the cabal. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we were, you know, you've, you've done this great work with the Keymaker series uh, that we just wanted to kind of kind of touch on and tell, oh man, what a huge, huge work that is. Uh, um, certainly something you want to go back to and re-listen because it's just so packed with, with, with uh, you know, what, what you channel and what you're, what you're uh, coming up with. And, and, and that paired in that crazy year of 2016 where the energies are really off the charts and it doesn't seem to stop, and uh, everything is moving faster, uh, including the matter. Now it's not just the thoughts; everything is catching up, uh, matter and uh, mental activity, and it's really coming to a to a cycle now where where uh, you know you either work with these energies or you or you you know you're lost at some point. Yeah, exactly. You know, I'm super juiced up. Like I. I got that. Um, I'm just really being more relaxed today so I can transmit the message. But also, you know, I got that super energized, <laughs> you know, so it's almost like, you know, I'm not using a lot of power, but I got a really high reserve. So that should be able to allow us to, you know, really start piercing through, you know, some of what I what I know people need to hear now in light of, you know, what's going on right now, what's going on today. And, uh, you know, just because people, if they're listening to this, it means that they, they need, you know, they need the pointer. Yeah. And, and then that's okay. You know, like at this point, we've gotten even to a level where when we say, well, you know, I listen to this person or I follow this person or, you know, this is my mentor. That's even now coming under criticism by the community. It's like, oh, you're not supposed to be following anybody. You're not supposed to be listening to anybody. And it's just like, it's getting overwhelming for a lot of people to grasp the oxymoronic uh, double tongue paradoxical aspect of the new age movement and supposedly spiritual knowledge. So I think that what can really clear a lot of that up is just for people to, to be who they are, because you know how they say, well, you know, you need to be who you are. <laughs> and, but what if you're this great being? And then what happens when people begin to feel threatened and society begins to feel threatened by that great being? And in addition to that, you know, I think that the freedom of speech is one thing because it's more of like, OK, we'll give you this so we can take away something greater because the, the freedom of action is not allowed. So we get the freedom of speech so you could say whatever you want, but you can't do whatever you want. You can't go making changes because that's when you're going to, you know, you're going to rub against, you know, what you've been talking about. 
So in this, you know, I want to talk about a lot of those double binds, you know, like, um, you know, you kind of jump out of the frying pan into the fire. You know, people stop believing in one thing, but then start believing in something that's still directly tied into the same thing they stopped believing, but a little bit more intense. You know, so, so those kind of things. So I'm looking to definitely drive around. I've kind of started my recording even since, you know, we got on the phone so we can even, you know, use some of this as the beginning because I'm sure people are going to know, you know, how do we launch off? <laughs> Yeah. But, you know, traditionally, I guess we can, you know, do whatever you want to do to open up the show. Um, I, yeah, I've been recording, too. Um, okay. But let's just do a formal welcome seven to, to our next sure. show. This is our third, what, fourth, third time together now? Fourth. Fourth, fourth time, uh, wow. which is great. Um, this has been such an energetic year for every one of us. We're really... Uh, uh, coming together here now and uh, 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 seeing seeing it evolve in a in, in a way where wow it's going so fast and it's really uh, your your if you put your mind to the matter it's it's manifesting in such a fast way uh, we've seen you with your with your key maker series which is an awesome uh, pile of work uh, definitely we'll go back and and listen to some of those uh, uh, packed with 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 knowledge and uh, you know very applicable uh, uh, kind of thought, mental stuff that that really makes you scratch your head but nod at the end of it. And um, um, it's great to have you on again. And we'll we'll let you um, go and uh, uh, um, present your your first start here of the show and uh, go from there. We have a few questions, but um, we really want to uh, take the time and uh, just let it flow. And uh, wow. Great to have you back on. Well, you know, well, it's always great to be on. Obviously, I'm, I'm looking to share, and you know, I always love sharing, especially with you two, because you know, it's just the intentions. Because you know, you, we we talked about this a long time ago, but you know, whatever you become and whatever you are is going to reflect in what you do, and the synergy that we have is really something to where we put our energies together and we create something different that's far greater than we could ever be by ourselves. And so I find that when I do get on Opting, that that happens. And, uh, and I've, of course, now I've gotten to the point where I always want to keep on that standard. <laughs> so <laughs> anything that, we, you know, is not somehow a part of that, I'm like, scratch it, let's go back again. So that's kind of so what happened in our, our lost archive, which will come out, you know, 10, 20 years from now. <laughs> it will be yeah. maybe more interesting than it would be then. But, yeah, I mean, it's definitely great to be on. I actually haven't done a show in a while, so people are asking me, you know, what's up? Next week, um, I have a retreat that's starting here in Costa Rica, and so I've been preparing for that. And then semester two is started, uh, actually going to start in June. So that'll be semester two of the university. Obviously, semester one was a knock out of the park, uh, just like the Keymaker series. Everyone enjoyed it. It's a different format, and that's generally what I attempt to do is I, I work with these different formats to see which one is really going to be um, – more or less the best way to get the message across to people. But what I find is that different formats work in different ways for different kind of people. So it's not really narrowing it down, but it does give for the person who's maybe more um, structural oriented, especially with the university, it gives them another method to like, okay, we're drilling into this topic and we're going to exhaust this topic and then we're going to move on versus, you know, sometimes my conversations can be a synergy within himself, mixing in several topics to show the connection. But in certain people, that, that because they don't function that way, that can tend to be a bit confusing for them. Uh, and then in other aspects, there's kind of practical knowledge. I call it life, you know, just what you deal with, with everyday life, happiness, you know, and diet and those kind of things. And I feel like that's a necessary part of what goes on with the ascension process, because if you're just into studying the cult and conspiracy, you actually flood your consciousness with a rather dark energy. And it's just saying it as it is. I know a lot of people are searching this knowledge and information with great intent. They want to help others. They want to find out the secrets. But we have to call it like it is. When you read something about, you know, mass genocide or, you know, entities from another realm that are diabolical and you start to process that in your consciousness, no matter how much of a, a let's say, light being, if you may, that you are, you still now have opened the door to a, a darker energy. So it's necessary that that be balanced out. I'm not telling a person at all to stop doing that, but I'm saying don't let it pull you in to a point where you're completely isolated from society. Now it's kind of got you backed in the corner. 
you start feeling like you can't even get out of the house, that nobody's vibing with you and that everyone's a part of it. And then, you know, pretty much it's a doomsday for that kind of individual. So thus, whatever the purpose of that kind of work would be on a negative aspect, it's now achieving that purpose with you. So I can find that I find that to be one of the things that the depths neophytes uh, and initiates alike need to keep aware of at all times is maintaining this balance because it is important and it's going to affect you primarily. And the other thing is for people to realize, you know, because sometimes we can get on this you know, somewhat of a save the world program. We talked about that a long time ago, but it's really in, in, in the tense to where when somebody says something to you or does something that you don't like in the overall conscious community, then this severely impacts your ability to keep delivering the message. You start to question whether or not you should even be delivering the message after all these people. And that's generally what the conversations go like. These people, they don't even seem like they want it or deserve it or whatever. But the truth is we have to realize where this is standing with us. This is not about everyone else. Primarily, this is about you. This whole process of learning information and distributing knowledge to others and assisting others with compassion is actually all about self because it shows you what you're really about. Are you, really to make the, are you willing to make the actions? Are you willing to stand behind your word? And especially if in the past, you know, if you have a history of just, I don't know, just doing stuff for the college or, you know, working, uh, working out at the gym, just nothing to do with spirituality and consciousness, you still have to put some work in. So I advise people to start thinking at times when they're melting down over the overall attitude of the, you know, the communities at large. But hey, remember, this is still for about you. This is about you creating that legend because in every aspect, if you learn how to motivate yourself, then you never really have to worry about yourself letting you down. But if you start hinging a lot of this on how people respond to you, and it's like a two-edged sword because you know people can send you, oh, thanks, and I love the thing that you're doing and what you did last week, and then you can also bite like a fish onto that hook and say, you know, start feeding into that. And oh yes, you know, yeah, I mean, oh, I'm doing great, yes, and I'm glad you're thanking me, and blah blah blah. I was and then as soon as you kind of get into that, then there also could be that next message, I think you're totally an idiot. And that tends to affect the person more that's kind of been on the rope of, you know, patting themselves on the back. Because even at this point, and I was telling someone about this yesterday, but at this point, for us to at all give ourselves any kudos or congratulations about anything that we've accomplished as far as consciousness, it'd be more like celebrating in the first quarter of a game as if we won. Yeah. This is just really beginning. There's a lot that people need to learn. And also we're literally, just like they tell you, you know, you come in as a neophyte and a lot of people think that, you know, they're coming in as an adept. Maybe they view ayahuasca one time and now they're a shaman or something like that, but it doesn't afford that kind of, of, of buffoonery. It's really where you come in as a neophyte. So there's plenty of things that you're going to need to learn. And also just because our culture and in the brainwashing and things has treated us like children in every aspect and and try to take care of us even if we're 50, 60 years old, rather than letting us self-substantiate and figure out what's going on for ourselves mentally, spiritually, physically, then what this actually leads to is it leads to quite a bit of you can't handle the truth, meaning that there's quite a bit of information that we need to ingest and come to truth in terms with so that we can make that transformation. And so at the end of the day or the beginning, depending upon how you look at it, we have to begin to realize that some people are here to give us that information. I'm one of them. You're one of them. Uh, and both of you are, I guess, both of you are one of them. That, that makes a lot of sense. So what I'm saying is, is that there's people out there that need to begin to believe that there are others who, while someone may be a good woodworker, and someone may be a good mechanic, and some people are even, you know, they're great at the computer, People are really good at spirituality. And what happens is if we just jump into this acting like everyone's great at spirituality just because we're like, well, we all have spirits. Well, we all have cars. So just because we have a car, it doesn't mean that we're all mechanics. So in every aspect, we have to realize that we need to begin to listen to those elders. You can go back to Alan Watts recordings um, and listen to what's really being presented and also look at the time frames being the fly on the wall in a tense to look what was happening 15 20 years ago and compare it to what's going on now and then really see have we progressed have we declined 
Are we still where we were before? You know, what were the pros and the cons? What were the pitfalls? Because if you're still in this for your expansion and your ascension, you would need to gauge something like that because, and this is something that, you know, we all have to realize that my day will come, your day will come. Um, when you're dealing in these kind of matrices, you're really, when you get to an exalted level of your own spiritual consciousness, you start realizing that obviously your advent out of here is still your progress into a much more greater expanse called the afterlife. So in that case, though, it still gives you a certain amount of time. That's what Earth is really about. It's based on symbol symbolism of time. And in this process of time, time will run out. So at this point, we do have the time now. <laughs> That's why they say the time is now. Not, we can't call the hands of time until we become, gain the ability to be, begin to predict our future. But as of now, we only can distill this moment and make the best of it. Because of course, you know, people got plans for next week, people got plans for five years, but nothing is guaranteeing that those plans except for their belief that that time will come. And I'm sure there's many people who thought that that time was gonna come in the future for them for something that they had planned and they never made it to that point. So that's a part of adepthood because you begin to accept those kind of things and then that empowers you and quickens you right now. So everything that may seem to come across as negative at first always has a very potent feel attached to it. Like I find sometimes when I'm in the meditations and for a moment I may see something that looks strange, there's this immediate uh, rush of fear. It only lasts like seconds, but it kind of changes the heartbeat and changes. You can feel even the fluid changes because you can feel the adrenaline come through. And as a you know, master meditator, you know to breathe that energy up because that energy right there is actually equivalent to possibly 100 to 200 breaths for a person who is just in there in the relaxed, tranquil state and hasn't mixed the fluids, serotonin, melatonin, adrenaline, and those kind of things in the spine yet because they're still working their way up the ladder. So again, just more proof that whatever it is that's out there that we may fear or may disturb us in one way or another, as adepts, we have to be willing to confront that because in that there is some power, not that we're gonna go worship it, not that it's gonna bestow some power upon us, but that our, sure, our sheer ability to confront it is going to place us in the position that we need to be in to get ready to deal with the truth of the matter. And so, you know, I think that that's a, a really good beginning. Also, I did want to say that, um, well, yeah, you know, we, we can start it right there because, you know, that, that's really what, what it, this is about. This is about, are we really unified or not? because I don't see unity in the conscious community. Actually, what I see is I see a lot of gossip. I see a lot of emotional games. And quite frankly, I see a lot of children playing with spirituality under its new wrap of, you know, eating, you know, you know eating the right way and, you know, and, mm. um, you know, just all the, all the little prototypes that are and stereotypes that go along with the conscious community, but spirituality, once again, is what this is actually really about. And spirituality gets us into identifying the profiles of still what's not seen. Because I'll say this, and then I'll take a brief pause. The power of what we're up against is primarily concentrated in its ability to be invisible. It is very real, but it operates outside of the spectrum of normal vision. It can be sensed but it's oftentimes not easily explained to those who seeing is believing since they can't put their eyes on it and it's been rather evasive in that nature, but it is very real. So for people who have seen that, even if it's just for a moment or have been around others who have gotten themselves headlong into something that they thought was kind of like a game at first and then now it's taken them, it's an ode or a testament to that there is something going on behind the scenes that actually equals all of the savagery and pestilence and injustice 
that's still going on. And just as Westerners, because or people who have adapted the Western mindset, because we're not experiencing that in real time, well, we're experiencing it, but we're not experiencing it to the degree that we feel like is uh, warranted for us to have a reaction. And I'll say it that way, because if you're born into some kind of crazy situation anyway, you may never know the difference. It's like, a, 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 let's say, a baboon in the zoo, just born in the zoo, is never going to know about the wild anyway. So that's just the standard things that go on in the zoo is like everyday life. So this is how it could be for us, even in our Western culture, where we're subjected to all this mm -hmm. brainwashing and all these different things. But And we're like, you know, yeah, it's, it's, it's not as bad as Gaza. And, but when we, why are we comparing two rather dismal situations? It's like we would first have to see, well, what was it really like when none of this stuff was going on and how were we then to really base exactly how difficult it is for us now to thrive? Mm -hmm. I really, I really liked when you said, uh, and I'm just going to take a minute to to draw this picture here. We we've thought about this a little bit, and and you you're bringing it right up. Wonderful. Uh, when you said, you know, people have been starting to go into that space and start to meditate, but it's not mixing the fluids, it's not bringing uh, uh, that that mixture up, it's not um, um, releasing yet, it's not um, expanding and relieving and spreading it out. We, we're in a state where we're, where we're still compressing and preserving and keeping these feelings down low, even though we've, yeah. you know, poured it into the soup, and we're all like, taste in the soup but there's one picture that we saw um, and that is kind of ex explanatory to that uh, if you look um, at the Giza power plant you know if you look at the Giza pyramid and um, at the at the blueprint from the side yeah uh, we yeah. see that the that the light goes into these shafts and they're at the angle and they meet in the middle okay everybody's seen that picture or many and and then take that and 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 hold it against the uh, Pink Floyd cover where the prism breaks into the seven rays, right? But that light there uh, on the Pink Floyd cover is not coming from above. That comes from below and breaks down below. And that is exactly what you were talking. We're preserving it. We're keeping it down. We're compressing it. We're not going through this depression. Uh, just yet one-on-one -on -one where we have to, you know, uh, uh, build it up in our own power plan, go through the depression, which means expanding. When something dep depresses, it expands. We grow into that and mix it then with the light that, yeah, light comes from above. So that angle uh, in the pyramid is the right one. And uh, 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 for some strange reason, the Pink Floyd cover shows it, shows it, you know, from the bottom back to the bottom. And that is, um, it's obviously the angle it falls in and, and, and gives us the chance to depress that. Yeah, and, and it's just because, you know, there's a lot of cryptic references to, I mean, I think the pentagram in itself is the most primary cryptic uh, message that behind the scenes that you're dealing with sorcery. And it's really because we have to look at in history, especially with the engagement of, of the British and just the whole idea of dominating other cultures. That what you're looking at is you're looking at an ideology and a mindset that's willing to take upon anything to dominate another person. Just like what we've seen in the Nazi regime, like anything, whether it's paranormal, whether it's uh, one waffles, wonder weapons, whether it's bombs, nuclear bombs, whatever that can be enlisted to bring about this world domination. So obviously that kind of mindset would be very vulnerable to anything of what we would call a darker imbalance or distorted nature. And the reality is, is that what we find is, is we find a moment in time to where humanity had got a reboot in a tense. And after that reboot, there was a, a, a long process of wholeness because there was a direct memory of, yeah, so last time when we started having our differences, it led to the entire destruction of our world because we are the world. You know, you don't got to be Michael Jackson to know that. Mm -hmm. So when we destroy ourselves and we have differences amongst each other, then we're going to throw off the balance. That's like, of course, one-on-one spirituality, but it gets a lot deeper because what we find is, is that when we study this knowledge, because I think today we'll get into a little bit about the difference between hermetics versus alchemy, 
And of course, now those two topics are almost like synonymous with one another, but in history, they actually weren't. And this is, of course, where we kind of would need to do more reading than listening at times because you'll find few people educated about those different levels of knowledge and those different sects, even Gnosticism. Like we actually say these words and we have a generalized me uh, determination of what they mean based on what someone told us. But if we went back and we seen Pythagoras, we see Simon the Magus and we see um, Apollonius of Tyana and we see these magicians even of the day or sorcerers of that day then we get a different picture of what we believe, let's say something like Gnosticism is based on what it's been interpreted to us as now. So what happens though is, is that all this is, it becomes very simple because the greatest power that one could ever really possess, and we have to understand that even um, these controlling factions are very well of this, we're very well aware of this, it's balance. And it's interesting because when you understand the definition of balance, it's not good and it's not bad. Bad and good are their own respective poles. Balance is something entirely different that we grow to learn and begin to define as we become more mature. Because obviously one who's just judging all the time doesn't really come into any real knowledge because you know they cut themselves off every time they make a judgment. When they make a judgment, then they're judged. It steers the, the consciousness of the, of the person judging within itself. So the truth is, is that we have to look at something simple that even, and I guess, you know, it's the British's day, but when you have cultures, and this is why a lot of this, the root of it still is spirituality. It's still the, the, the uh, quarrels that were brought about through the different cultural beliefs, even, let's say, in Islam and Hinduism, the difference between these cultures and when these people had to share the same space, in this space, let's say, is uh, united India, then there was a huge breakdown because the Sikhs, the Muslims, and the Hindus couldn't get along from their cultural level. And it began to erode the kingdom. And then at a certain point, you find one who's very w aware of balance. And just let me, let me show you how this works, because we are so naive at times in interpreting everything as, is it good or bad? It's like the flaw in our brain, because it, it always defaults to wanting to put things in one category or another category, good or bad. But what happens is, is that then the British move in, operating under the laws of balance, and say, we're going to be the mediators between all of you. We're going to give you the rule, because think about what balance is. It's actually the, it's, when you look at scales, it's that middle point, that rule, that straight line that now is gonna mm -hmm. be there to allow the other two sides to teeter-totter, but still balance them out, themselves out at some point. Yeah, so sure. you can Right, so you, so you can then see how something that we would perceive as good, like, okay, once I achieve balance, then I'll sin. Uh, you, you know, it's like you got to go further in your thinking. Balance is a tool in itself. If someone comes in with it and you have two, three, four, five warring factions and something knows how to come in and, and instill balance through the power because balance is more powerful than positive or negative or one side or another or differences, then they will rule. Mm -hmm. So we see that happen in India and in Pakistan. We saw that happen in Mesoamerica with the, the tribes fighting the Aztec the Tiwo and Tiwo Tiwo Khan and all those different places. We saw in North America, the, tr the Indian tribes or the Native American tribes going to war with each other, the Blackfoot Indians and the Cherokees. We've seen this in Africa or Akibulan, where you've seen the tribes of the Zulu begin to war with, with the Ashanti. Like you start seeing that when we start having all these differences and when we're not unified, then we set ourselves up for an external power to come in that's just waiting for us to begin to enact that whole process mm -hmm. of differences so that it can come and then become our ruler. And how this is happening, because this is happening now in the conscious community. So when you study history enough, you can see the new thing, uh, or you can see the new thing being affected by the old thing. Because in the conscious community, because everyone's so divided about 
And let's see whether we should be vegetarians or whether we should not, or whether this guy's really a Mason or whether he's really not, and maybe he's lying. And, you know, again, there's all this gossiping going on. This person believes you shouldn't be using names, but now you're using names. So now they want to take their community away from where you are because you're wrong. So then what moves in is a force like Baphomet, because then that becomes the ruling force that says, oh, but here's the rules. And I'm going to bring this balance. And then some people are, are thinking, well, isn't that a good thing? <laughs> See, that's the trick. That's the programming. The mind defaults to say, was well, that good or bad? But time is going to go on and things are going to play out and you're going to see a back and forth volley. So it's not good or bad. What you're going to have is you're going to have a new system that attempts to emerge in acting as the balancing component between people's spirituality and those that are hungry. Because remember, I, I've seen a lot of people that they're still so hungry for this internet fame. They've only bought it into the spiritual arena that when they're really propositioned with the mindset of the same thing that we pledge to get ourselves out of, then they begin to adapt that. If they're told for one moment that, hey, you're the one that's supposed to be in power, they call the Messiah complex then they will adapt the same thing that supposedly years ago that they said that we didn't need to do. So what I'm advising people to do is to start thinking of yourself in a nucleus and what kind of energy you're sending out and what you're doing, because that's where it stops. Like I was thinking about this word gossip today. I said, you know, that's funny because it's like ghost sipping. Now, I, I try to keep my, my etymology and breakdowns of words really exact because I get people who email me with some wild stuff and I'm like, uh, yes, but no. I mean, we kind of want more structure around what you just, you know, uh, synchronize. But, you know, so this is an example of one. But in every extent, if it's like an analogy to help us remember something, you know, because I do that sometime when I'm trying to remember something, I'll say, okay, well, this number is associated with like the last two numbers in my, my date of birth. So I'll always remember that number if I'm asked again. So you can associate things with other things to remember them. So gossiping, I call gossiping because what you get is, is you get these invisible forces who are just aware of, who are more aware of who's, who's who and what's what and who's going to be making changes in the future than even those people are. And then they're constantly attempting to cause that confusion between all of those people. And, and it keeps up and it keeps going and it keeps us divided. So that's, that's the beginning of the conversation today is the big question of are we unified? And because we're not, what is that ultimately going to equal for the community at large that is attempting to expand in this realm of spirituality when we're dealing with entities which we call spirits, hello, that are actually invisible to the naked eye, but operate in the person's consciousness. And have we firewalled our consciousness so that way when that urge comes along to call some kind of dissension or to find some kind of difference between one thing and another rather than finding the unifying components or even you know, really doing the work in, in, in working on bringing the, the connection. You know, Like if you find a difference in something that someone believes, and you know it's just completely out of line. <clears throat> I'm sure if you go to that person and say, hey, you know, here's some information that I found and here's my own experience with what you're talking about and I find it to be a little bit different than what you're talking about. That's love. You see what I mean? Like if you're going mm -hmm. to talk to somebody and you're gonna, you really wanna help them, not you wanna make them feel that someone, that you're more powerful than them. I always get people telling me, well, I know a person who has more experience than you. This is still like, my dad can be your dad, you know, and, and, and that kind of aspect of looking at this, because it's not about who's greater and who's smaller. It's about whether we're going to make it out yeah. <laughs> because all of the, the playing, you know, all the back and forth volleying going on, it's gotten nowhere. It's been five years now. If we were set out to do what we said we're going to do, we would start seeing major changes now, not awakening people to information of things that they can do nothing about. I can't do anything about a flat earth. You see what I mean? I can change my consciousness. I can change where I'm at in that whole aspect of things, where I'm at in my being. But I, I can't do anything about the military industrial complex. 
You see what I mean? Like if I want to go down there and march and tell them they need to shut that down. You see what I mean? Or if I do, I probably will spend my whole life trying to do just that, maybe to get one base closed down. And at the end of the day, five more will pop up. So we have to ask ourselves, are we really working at the level that we should be working? Are we beating our heads against the physical reality? Because that's what they call a materialist. Even a person who's looking to manifest some kind of spiritual phenomena into the physical reality was known in the times of the, the let's say, the, the greats, the Therians, as a materialist. Because you're still looking to make something happen and manifest within the physical world, which even a lot of people get into the astrology, they get into sorcery, they get into magic, they get into manifestations to make things happen in the physical world. And again, there's nothing right, nothing wrong about this. This is the easiest way to be balanced. There's nothing right, nothing wrong about it. I'm just observing the whole phenomena. But the truth is, how do we progress beyond the physical plane? Because that's where we're going. <laughs> like if we have to like research what we're supposed to be doing next than it would be when we're entering into that non-physical, that non-corporeal. What are the mechanics and what are we going to be encountering there? And is, any, is there any hints here that give us more of an idea of what that may be? And of course, the answer is yes. So what I got here is, you know, it depends on if there's any more questions. If I really wanted to run over really briefly, and this is going to be a bit rough. It's going to be like a rough draft. But you remember, I got to try this out on somebody, meaning that it's got to come out and then it's going to get smoother and smoother as it keeps coming out. It's core truths, but it's so difficult to get your arms around, you know, trying to translate it. Let's just see what happens. I can't say it's going to be a bad translation now, but I'm giving a disclaimer that, you know, I got to explain something that is a little bit more difficult to explain than the last thing, <laughs> if that's possible. And, uh, and that's just, of course, you know, if we're ready to go into that, because I think that at this point, we're really going to need to get on the same page about history and her story, right? Because there's something that we start to begin to realize right away. And it's that when you start studying the past and it's, there's a lot of manipulation that goes on just between the two components of the male and the female, mm -hmm. because there's always an agenda to make one seem to be worse than the other. There's the judging. And in the observation, what you start to find is, is that let, if we just put, put, label, put uh, polar, polarity labels on it, a female would be a plus and a minus, and a male would, let's say, be a minus and a plus. But both of them would contain both aspects of what we would perceive as male and female. But the issue is, if we perceive female as negative and male as positive, as the Indo-European cultures did when they usurped the matriarchal societies, then we get into this whole weird conundrum because we start to interpret people, live human beings, in the aspect in which they're not cast in. They're not just negative and they're not just positive. They both contain both poles. And in fact, the only ones which we'll find are the ancient ancestors that truly were able to embody that positive negative pole without showing a gender difference in the physical realities were the first ones also known as the androgynins. That when you look at the cultures in every secret society and you understand how to interpret those words that are being mentioned in the history that's even on the walls, what they're attempting to explain is that the androgynin, you can even say a, a 10, a one and a zero, a being that has a one and a zero, actually became what was known as the lost word. That's what I say in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. So they're saying that the word is actually a being. So when they say the word is lost, that means that somehow these beings no longer come back into the physical reality as much. Now you don't see any real androgynins coming out. And this is because there's an imbalance going on within our own system. Because just from a chemical level alone, the androgen would contain an equal balance of all those chemicals. When a person comes out as male or comes out as female, for what we call male and female, then they're 
exhibiting a slight imbalance. It's like why we use our left hand or why we use our right hand. Some people are more partial to one, one partial to the other. There's an imbalance. So it was already known that the original balance was actually achieved within one specific being. And this comes off in Judaism as the Kadman. It comes off in Hinduism as Adonari. It comes off in, uh, in uh, Hermeticism as Her Hermes, the hermaphrodite. It comes off in Venusian knowledge as Aphrodite. It, see, it's in all of these cultures that the first physical perfect form is androgynous, not a male or not a female. But what we also have to pay attention to is just what we're dealing with now with this advent of celestial energy. Well, it's not even an advent. It didn't just start. It's always been going on, but it definitely seems like it's intensifying because we're getting closer and closer and because we're breaking down the wall between the realm of the living and the realm of the dead. The actual confusion that we have about what goes on in afterlife, even with us, we're starting to chip that down and start to realize more about reincarnation. And, you know, we're plugging at it. We may not be completely exact, but we're at least now starting to realize that there's something going on beyond this. And so... What this brings us to then is it brings us to a point where we realize that these systems like planets work in cycles. So if the big argument is what came first, the chicken or the egg, because that's actually what it starts boiling down to in, after a while in the first start of, thought of your consciousness, what you have that came first is an androgen. And in its coming into physical reality, it still can be perceived more as a female because it has a womb. And that's how we started to associate the first androgenin with being primarily female, but also containing a male component, having the ability to generate on its own, which they call parthogenic or parthogenesis. So what we also witness with this, because this is, this is the major key point to everything that you're ever going to see in occultism, everything you're going to see in movies, everything you're going to see everywhere, is this hidden war that's going on because that initial androgynous being containing a womb was also vying for its position when it began to produce more life, meaning as more physical life forms came out, you had these male or female polarized entities coming out. And when we pull away all the money and all the distractions and all these different things that are put in front of us now as being valuable, when you're talking, now you're ancient now, now you're up there, there's writing on the wall, you know, hieroglyphs, there's big pyramids, there's, you know, fo folks floating around, there's vimanas, there's dorje rods. When you put yourself back in that setting, the only thing that's really of power is having the ability to continuously come into these realms. And that's actually what even the Tibetan Book of the Dead and the Egyptian Book of the Dead really entail, is actually how to maintain a body in the, spirit, in the physical reality forever. That's why there was so much time and attention in putting put into the embalming process and keeping the body preserved. So that way, when the spirit left for that moment, it could return back to that body and reanimate that body. Mm -hmm. So the only other way then beyond that to get back into the physical reality was to come through the woman's womb. And so that also was sig significant to the power, that there was power in that womb. Mm -hmm. So this is why later on, you start to see, and Jung talks about this, the, especially the Indo-European patriarchal mindset become extremely threatened by this womb because to them, it's the key to getting in and out of physical realities. It's the key to immortality. And because the male doesn't have one, then an agenda launch for the male to actually get one. And this is what you start seeing in science. Actually, it goes as long, it's old as Akhenaten. It's even older than that. But the process of it's, it, it, it's embodied within the Church of Christ today, where Christ is the male, but the church is the female. The wound in the side of Christ is really his vagina. One is to suckle from the wound to sustain themselves. And, you know, you see in the literature, the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of James, you begin to see in the literature the actual, even statements like, if a woman is to enter into the kingdom, she must first become a male. 
you start seeing the stuff that they moved away because they were like, you know, if we show them the, the true art of sorcery, because that's what this stuff starts getting into, then they're going to know we're sorcerers. So we just want to keep some of these watered down books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And we want to get rid of Thomas. We want to get rid of James. We want to get rid, rid of the, Apoc the Apocryphon. We want to get rid of these books because it reveals the identity of what we're doing, how we're going to basically replace Mary. And that's why Every Mary in the Bible is actually speaking of the same person. There's not Mary Magdalene and the Mary the whore and then the Mary this. They're, they're giving you the aspects, all the aspects of what they perceive about the divine feminine. And in this, even in the text, as it says, they're going to attempt to make Mary male and then allow Jesus to surround Mary and become the new kingdom. And then Mary would just exist within that kingdom. And sure enough, just as we see in Christianity, Mary is not the centralized figure. Jesus is. But even deeper than that, you know that this is happening because, in, especially in the cabals, because, <laughs> that's funny, every time you see a male take on a position of power in the world, they always have to take on the feminine attributes. They must put on the dress. If for a yeah. judge, it's the robe. Yeah. For the masons mm -hmm. to apron, right? And then they must put on the wig. That's parliament. And if you really start looking at it, it's like a long list of things that they do in order to take on or actually try to usurp the role of the divine feminine. And it's because the first systems of knowledge, which is the knowledge of Mayat, that was ever on the planet was about the planet, the cosmos. It, it was mainly about the planet, the moon, and the sun, just what you can see, like the little stars, that, that was like extracurricular knowledge. That was when you really graduated and you could actually project yourself to figure out what was going on. The largest celestial bodies were the primary bodies studied. And so through that knowledge, through the knowledge of Mayat, which is alchemy, alchemy means the blackness. Al means the, Kimi means black, the study of blackness. It's why we get chemistry, mystery, all these words all say the same thing, the study of blackness, because it's a knowledge that's purveying everything that we come from that womb. We come from that darkness into light. So if we need to try to understand anything, then we need to study darkness. We need to study chemistry. We need to study mysteries. And when we come into English with that though, and this is where we gotta realize the play, <laughs> Medunetter has 2,000 letters. English has 26, in a, in a hidden 26. So if you're trying to explain attainments of the higher realms, you need a language that you can read up, down, left, right, up, down, left, right, right to left, and uh, down and up, which hieroglyphs you can. And each way you read it renders you the explanation based on the direction in which your consciousness is going. So if you're going in the logical direction, whatever you're reading is going to give you the logical definition of that. If you read it from bottom to top, you're going to get the ascension or futuristic version of what you're reading. So this allows you to make sure that you don't come into any misunderstandings. And it also allows you to read something in balance versus, and many people don't know that, versus in English, you're going one direction, which is the logical side of the mind and also the way of death. The way we read English, look, write a word and notice you read it from left to right. Now look at the clock and notice you watch time move from left to right. Now then ask yourself, if it's 19 or excuse me, 2016 now, but for someone who was living 3000 years ago, were they counting time down? <laughs> like, that's how they put it, right? Like, d during Julius Caesar's time and, you know, around those times, they were counting time down. They were like 500, 499, 498, 490, right? So what, just in that alone, what does that do for your consciousness? Instead of counting up, like, I'm getting older, you're counting down like I'm getting younger. Yeah. Huh. And then on top, on top of that, right, what are we counting down to? Because, you know, if you're just in there and you're like, hey, guys, uh, what are we counting down to, guys? Because what's going to happen at zero, yeah. right? So, but what did they tell us happened at zero? That's the difference between a, uh, AD and BC, right? 
But surely we can't believe that it's just narrowed down to this mythological Christ myth, which is actually more of a title than it is actually a person. But it does give us a hint to what's actually happening, that Julius Caesar and Jesus Christ and even John Carter, if you watch the movie for that matter, is actually codes for the process of this idea that the masculine is actually going to take over the world. The king, the masculine king, which you can't say it's a divine masculine. So this is, this is the other thing. I don't want to skip over things here, but let me, let me just put a, a quick note here. You have to realize that when I also identify that everyone has a positive and negative inside of them, you can say that, that one is the divine feminine and one is the undivine feminine. One is the divine masculine and the other one's the undivine masculine. Now, every person has within themselves that distorted, ignorant side that needs, you need to bring light to. So some people in history have become the total embodiment of that ignorant, dark side and have chose to exist and live just as that. So these are very important points because we start realizing that many individuals come off balance quite some time ago and begin to utilize this knowledge that was coming from Alexandria. Really, it came out of Kemet. And if you remember, Kemet in, in, in Egypt is not too far away. Alexandria is a hop, skip, and jump. And what you see take place is that all of the people who are the founders of the secret societies that have dwelt for thousands of years, the sorcerers mainly, which are the names you should remember, Pythagoras, Apollonius of Tyana, Simon Magus, and a few other people that I'm going to end up mentioning during this conversation. But these are cults of sorcerers that are taking the knowledge of Mayat, the Divine Mother, and then construing it into their hermaphroditic religion of inversion, which now comes out as Baphomet. It's, I guess it's a goat. See, the thing is, is that some people try to interpret the symbol and explain the symbol as balance and explain the symbol as having all these deep hidden meanings. But it, that may be true. But there's no way, and excuse my French, that a goat with titties is going to come across to a neophyte as anything that they're going to be able to gain a lot of knowledge from. They're going to be so conscrewed because of the imagery itself, <laughs> they're not going to be able to bring forth any positive thoughts. They're going to think that all this mystery and all these traditions have to do with something that is evil. And that's what I meant to, to bring up when I was talking about the language. See, in English, our word for negative and evil and even dark all seem to run together. And this is the part of our problem. Yeah. Right? Because negative is also the same thing on the battery when we have to have two poles, right? Yeah. And then darkness is something that happens at night, but it's not necessarily a bad thing either. But now evil, evil is a distortion and a retardation that comes about because of a defunct language. So that sounds like more of what we're talking about when we at times can conscrew the word negative for evil. So we have to, in this conversation at least, remember when I'm saying darkness because then I'm just talking about the other component to light mm -hmm. versus when I'm talking about evil, which is what's brought about through the ignorance and the distortion of languages and thought processes right. and all of the activities that go on that one may engage in that corrupts them. Yeah. Okay? And there's so a, that, that's a good thing yeah. to bring up or to, to get clear on. Yeah, there, there, there's another word that uh, absolutely fits uh, with, with our stuff here, and that's uh, the, the Sha words, the, the shadow and the shaman, which, you know, the she-man, the shadow. Uh, it's definitely the dark aspect. Um, you know, if you, if you look where shaman comes from, was, uh, I think, uh, uh, a Dutch younger guy that, that went to, you know, today Russia you know, up there Siberia and he saw those uh, women do their magic you know and it, it, uh, they mm -hmm. must have had a pact with the devil you know was a 18 year Dutch Christian guy that wants to learn about language you know got scared and ran back and called them the shamans you know supposedly but uh, um, there's more to it but uh, uh, yeah those words that the shadow side of it is that we all have them all always with us Exactly. And then the other thing is, is that we can never get under the impression that studying any of this stuff that we call spirituality is just going to be all butterflies, unicorns and rainbows. 
which happens. You know, we've gotten to a point where we feel like that if we're studying this knowledge and we, we found the right knowledge, then it's actually supposed to accompany something that's very fluffy and lovely. And that's, that's you know, that's our own interpretation. What this is really getting into is it's getting into the operations and the mechanics of how worlds are built and how spirits are, tra the, what they call the transmigration of souls, the balancing of the world, or actually in this case, the transmigration of spirits. The, you can't even have an identity for what's called the soul because it's nameless. It doesn't fit into any conformity. And that's actually what is allowing us to keep going and have this perpetual existence because nobody has figured it out. Because just like I was saying before uh, about, it's just like the male who has this, you know, this woman he meets and he's totally enamored by her. But the more that he learns about her and the more time that he spends with her and the more that he gets from her, the moment that he thinks that he has her figured out, then he becomes disenchanted. And now he wants to go and find something else that stirs that whole thing up for him again. And that's an instinct. We need to think about this. We do this all the time. We do it with even other objects, toys, electronics, different, our job. At first, it's like, man, this is going to get me somewhere. And then, you know, four weeks later, it's like, oh, my goodness, I need to find another job. So what happened? One became disenchanted. So the thing is, you can never become disenchanted by the soul. And thus, it can never be identified. It, those two run hand in hand. That's why when they try to find this whole God particle and all that, it still drives them nuts because they can't. They have all the other particles. They have different things that attract and repel. These are sorcerers. They're hermetics. So hermetics studies alchemy, but more from the aspect of poisons and different things that are actually going to, to, uh, to take away or subdue an individual. And, it, and it very, it's very clear. The difference between a sorcerer versus someone like, let's say, a medicine woman is one is in service to the people. The medicine woman spends all of her time giving these medicines and making these herbs and things to heal. The sorcerer wants to be served. So all these kings then, and this is what people need to realize, all these kings, all these presidents are sorcerers. I don't care how strong their craft is or how weak their craft is, they still fall under that definition because they want someone to serve them. And that becomes a simple manipulation of energy on the astral plane to where the person's energy, rather than recycling with their higher self, which has basically left them here as a seed to grow up and continues to resonate as a connection until they do so, is being interrupted by something who wants to siphon and funnel that energy into itself. So we should be very clear about that. And then the other thing that we should also should know is during the divine feminine cycles, everything is about pleasure and abundance. I'll say it again. During the divine feminine cycles, everything is about pleasure and abundance. Because if you're on earth and the divine feminine cycle is in its climax, there's so much fruit, trees, singing, songs, dancing, mm -hmm. curves, waving, vibrations, and happiness, and all of what you can embody the divine feminine as, because I think every male is familiar with the divine feminine. So all of those embodiments are what's really in play. So when you get these distorted masculine cycles, now it's scarcity, now it's money, now it's a challenge, now it's all of those things that we dislike the most, which is what's happening to our world now. So for me, it's not about jumping on one side or another. I'm just an observer. I'm, I can't jump on sides anymore. I already know that game. But mm -hmm. I don't want to live in a world that lives on scarcity because I see what it does to the organisms that live in it. And it's sad. You start to watch just, the, you know, I don't even got to explain it, but you start to watch that back and forth and that grinding go on and the spite and the hatred. Now, remember also that what this causes, because I'm not saying that there's not a distorted feminine, which is the Lilithian force of the Lilith. And that comes out more, though, and it's entertained. Like even, uh, you know, the, the horrible, I, didn't, I couldn't even watch but a couple minutes of it, but Beyonce put out a documentary called Lemonade that pretty much, if you ever had questions that she, if she, were they were in the cult or not, you definitely know now. And also in that, you see that their affiliation is with voodoo. 
And you also see that voodoo surrounds itself by a negative dark queen who is the embodiment of a woman when she is abused by the divine, or excuse me, the undivine and distorted masculine. Yeah. So I think everyone's run into a woman who's gotten out of a very bad relationship and the man was at fault and she was doing everything that she could and then watched what she turned into after that. So because all these energies are very real, even for that woman, that energy starts to appeal to her, that distorted feminine. See, they're no good. See, they're trying to take everything away. But also remember that the goal here is not to go from one side to the other. The goal is just to remember before any of these cycles started, there was an androgen. It wasn't a male and it wasn't just a female. It was both. So the back and forth volley that we're dealing with now between the masculine and the feminine forces are being regulated, arbitrated, if you may, by these so-called powers that be. So as long as they can keep us in confusion about the exact identity of these primal forces, then we will forever believe that, oh, well, yeah, that's right. We need to overthrow this, we need to overthrow this distorted masculine uh, cycle so that we can get back to the divine feminine. That's not what I said. What I said was, is we need to get divine feminine and divine masculine in harmony. And only then will we really enjoy our stay on the physical planes. And when one starts to come into realizing that, then they work and they toil night and day in the field to bring that balance about. And that's actually what I'm engaged in. I'm engaged in unifying the field, not saying that, oh, well, it was better during this time or it was better during that time and I wish it could be back like that again. It's really about, well, what are we gonna do with this now? And what we find is, is that also, this is so easy to do and it tends to, we do it naturally. We're naturally harmonic, just like a rainbow naturally appears up there. Nobody's got to do anything to show you all the spectrum of the rainbow. And in fact, let's desist for one brief moment to talk about what the rainbow really is and how you get all the symbolism and even all the text that's necessary as far as occult text about what the rainbow is. Because it's first stated by the God of the Bible, who, who clearly is part of this nefarious agenda, that let the rainbow be a sign of my covenant, okay? So when we move that out of the mouth of the one who wants to try to steal all the power all the time, what we get said is that the rainbow is a sign of the agreement, okay? So what agreement are we talking about? And sure enough, if we keep digging or even meditating, we'll find that every single aspect of the body mainly the primary organs and the primary fluids, the primary uh, glands, mm. they all move in a certain number sequence, but they are drastically different from one another. But what they've done is, is they've somehow come into a synergy, which in, by definition means it's no longer what it was before, but it has become a collaboration of everything involved is that was involved in order to create something better. So there's a synergy in that that takes place in order to create something that's greater. So what the rainbow is, is the, rain, the rainbow is a sign of those colors, which cover the entire spectrum, coming together to become something greater. So this is the first thing. And watch, we'll, we'll show with the word, the rain, with the symbol of the rainbow, we find the truth. Now also, when there's a transition between one color and another color, it doesn't just start there's a fusion of those two colors that go on like, the, like a monitor. It's got millions of these fusions of colors and different shades of purple until it finally transcends into the next color. Those are the marriages. Those are the blending that goes on in order to create a bridge between one absolute, I'm red, and another absolute, I'm orange. Mm -hmm. And then we get this fusion of colors. So when we play that out in the physical realm, because as above, so below, what we find is, well, what is the whole purpose of this agreement? And this is what one just says when they're in the meditation about this whole thing. Well, what is the purpose of this agreement? It's to build a bridge. 
And sure enough, we find that the same design of the rainbow is actually the same design that most bridges are built in. Yeah. And it's for a reason. And they even call it Rainbow Bridge. But what are we talking about? A bridge to what? Well, it's a bridge from the world of the living to the world of the hereafter, which we need to stop calling the realm of the dead. And when that rainbow bridge is broken, now there's no connection between those two worlds. And that's also in the Norse mythology about them breaking the bridge, right? Mm -hmm. So then when you go on, what you find out is, is that we were responsible for keeping the connection between us and our ancestors. Now, I used to get confused about this, especially when I started. I was throwing the baby out with the bathwater. But to understand and connect with one's asset ancestors is no different than you inter connecting with your great grandma. And if you're not into doing that, it's because you've been brainwashed. If you won't take care of your parents when they're dead, if you won't go and visit your grandma when she's old, it's because you're out of balance. You're not even like what all of us used to be because we knew what, what are we doing? We're making this connection between the realm of the living and the realm of the hereafter so that way we can have immortality true immortality, which is actually being conscious of your living. See, immortality is guaranteed for every being, but the definition of immortality actually means that you're conscious through the entire process. So that got a little confusing for me in the meditation. So I asked for a deeper explanation. And I says, okay, well, let's erase it all right now. And then let's just talk about your memories. Now, your memory. If you don't have memory, what do you have? Well, first of all, if I didn't have a memory, I would have never remembered to get on the phone today. I actually would have never remembered to get on the computer. Actually, what is a computer? Actually, who am I? Mm -hmm. You see, it all is nothing without memory. Memories are the only power. Yeah. You see, this is where we start drilling into it. Like, this is what I have to say to everyone today. Like, I don't care how long I'm going to be here. As long as I can get this across, then everything is already in the works for the benefit of humanity. Understand that your memory is your power. Because here's one advantage of having memory of your ancestors. You'll know not what to do again. Yeah. <laughs> See, the ancestors beat their heads against the process of, the process of going through physical realities and what to do and what not to do in order to maintain the balance, which is that rainbow. And they learned that we all need to work together. And there could even be marriages between what we would think is two opposing forces, yellow and or, 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 or red and blue. And then comes this synergy of even greater beauty. So we're having a great time. But if we break those connections, if we allow our differences See, the difference is, is why I'm yellow and you're orange. But when someone says, well, everything should be yellow, it's like the movie The Giver. You start to see that that kind of consciousness is actually more malevolent than any kind of consciousness. Because what it produces is it produces one who can make actions and not even feel like there's anything wrong with what they're doing. Case in point, when the, when the Muslims wanted to exterminate the Hindus, they did it in the worst ways, cutting people open, bellies, mothers, raping, the whole nine. But somehow that felt okay because, after all, these people were different and they weren't like them. So that gave them the feeling inside that they could do that. That's what happens when we start to disrespect the differences. Now, remember, I'm not talking about evil because I see I found my my message constantly being disturbed by evil attempting to assert that, yes, that also means evil too. We must come into balance with evil. No, 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 evil. Evil, you're in your own distorted world. You're not darkness. You're not the deep, dark purple. You're not blue, black. You see what I mean? That's, you're something else. You're the distortion and the confusion that comes across when the bridge is broke. And that's why they explain to you again, now when we go back to the occult lore, that Yada Baal, which is definitely, a t it's called a, a, te a tetra, it's called a tetragrammatis, a chimera. What it means is, is that in the attempt to formulate this male womb that I was telling you about, 
that there came forth a creation from this male womb, male aspect first, and that is the God of the Bible. That is the one that is in the whole, I mean, it's obviously anti-feminine in the Bible if you didn't check it. And in fact, when you really get the real books, it talks about circumcision is actually not just to cut the foreskin. Circumcision is to cut the entire penis. And then the man is to be made an Enoch, meaning that he's no longer to engage with women. Same thing with the Knights Templar. In their oaths of monkhood, and in most oaths of monkhood, by the way, you are never to engage with a woman again. The Knights Templar even went one more step. You couldn't kiss your mother or your sister. So what we're seeing is clearly what I'm explaining, that something is back there attempting to sever the two forces. Woman is then seen as negative and corruptible. Man is then seen as some type of uh, even space being from the lights and the sun god. You see what I mean? And then they got us over here believing in all this stuff and destroying ourselves through our beliefs. If there was anything truly right about it, I wouldn't even be on the phone today. I would be having a great time in our balanced world with our bridge. And then I would be connecting to my ancestors for thousands of years ago and not acting like I'm totally disassociated with them. I would know my history and I would know what all these herbs do and I would have a communication with them rather than looking at them on the shelf all dehydrated. You see, so I know where the greater world is. I know what the better world is. No one has to convince me of that. I can't be convinced edgewise either. So what I'm saying is when we get true knowledge and true adepthood, it starts to reveal this to us through us. It starts to show us the same way we act now and the same things that we believe. This is the root to it. The root is because for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, there's been an agenda to enslave our every being through us being divided. Because in that, we can't have power. You're talking about a phenomenal cosmic power being split into so many different parts that none of those parts have an effect. It's almost like a person who's very powerful but trying to do too much. Hello, I'm one of them. I have so many responsibilities. My power is in speech. My power is in writing. I find myself trying to figure out who slipped a worm into the site and now is crashing. I find myself trying to figure out, you know, what kind of uh, camera that's needed that's going to stay on for more than 30 minutes. I find myself trying to figure out how we're going to generate more capital just to keep alive what we spent six years building. You see? So this is why one can then realize because there's no power in division. <laughs> and until people start coming together, then you don't have blue where red should be and yellow where pink should be. Everyone is at their stations and what they enjoy. And in the event, and this is what true, let's say we'll use the word magic today is, in the event that you're ready to make a transfer, then you already know what the diametric opposition of what you need to blend with in order to cause that transfer. Meaning if you decide, well, now I want to go experience X, it's in the herb. There's an herb for it. There's a color for it. There's a crystal for it. There's a time of day for it. There's so many correspondences to whatever you're attempting to achieve, then it means that you're truly limitless. That's what this was. So don't let also these people convince you that Earth has always been a prison system. It wasn't built and designed that way. Yeah. What happened was the greed and the jealousy and the envy of the differences See, because in the ancient culture, what they attempt to teach you first is how you're unique and how everything is created unique to have a unique divine purpose. But all comes from the same source. That's one that's rites of passage 101. You have to know what your uniqueness is, because when you find your uniqueness, that method in which you use to find it allows you to also teach others how to find their uniqueness. Now notice, you're not trying to teach them how to be like you. <laughs> you just missed the, you flunked the course. After all, everything is unique. You're attempting to show them the, the, the core path, which 
is works for everyone of how to understand your uniqueness. And then also you are instilling within them that, but we all come from the same source. We have this unique divine purpose. Now, it of course reminds you then of even how the Mayan societies were won, were run with them knowing what your purpose was, like what you were good at. And they put you into that faculty and that capacity, you know, blue snake lightning, you know, he's good at climbing trees and, and bringing in these fruits and then also generating energy of this special kind of force. You see, so each person has their unique ID. And this is each person then, because now we have to get real, real with this. Each person then being in themselves a part of the chain that is expanding across the abyss that is allowing us not to fall in it. See, right now we're falling in the abyss. Our bridge is broken. So the uniqueness that made us all great is now actually becoming our Achilles heel the more that we're taught that we should all be the same way. You see? So this is, this is really important pointers today because it gives some demarcations between, like I said, what is true uniqueness? What is evil versus darkness? What are these different components? Because if we don't know these and we take it for granted, then we're led astray. And there is enough of these entities, because remember what you're dealing with, and I'll rewind for one moment here. What you're dealing with in the Egyptian Book of the Dead is actually the instructions on how to maintain immortal on the physical plane. That's what the book was written for. And these people are not playing. We play, they don't play. This wasn't just fanciful for them. They figured out something. So why do you think it was so important, the Rosetta Stone for the controllers that we're dealing with today? because they didn't know what those prayers said. So they didn't know the method or the formula or the ingredient or the recipe to immortality. Now that they know it, they emulate that all the time. They take the pyramids, they got the stuff down at the Louvre, you know, all in their secret society. They got all Anubis there. They got the entire Egyptian book of the dead consistently on display that no one understands except for those who crack the script to know what the script means. Mm -hmm. And so thus they're deifying themselves. That's what they were counting down to. Well, we're going to, because this, this God that they're worshiping, which if you ever really understand this stuff, or if you ever even have the opportunity to speak with someone who is a sorcerer, they're very clear about this. Their God lives in the realm of Nod. Their God lives in the realm of the dead. Because if you look in the text, because Cain becomes the embodiment for the androgynin. That's why you always, the male androgynin, that wanted a male womb that I was explaining earlier, the, that's code name Cain. Cain goes to the land of Nod. That's known as the astral plane or the realm of the dead or the realm of those that sleep. And the reason why it's called as such is because few, only the greatest adepts, can stay in the astral plane indefinitely. And even then, it breeds a certain level of madness. Why? Because it's not stable. See, the whole reason for us to ha be on Earth and why Earth is often associated with a tree and with roots and you need roots, you need ground, is because you cannot just float off into the abyss indefinitely and expect to maintain any kind of memories. You can't anchor yourself. So they say that their God went into that realm and is maddened by that realm. So anytime that that God is bought into this realm or evoked into this realm on those specific holidays, it comes ravaging, pillaging, and all distorted and just maniacal. Every, there's even words. The words that mean the most craziest things are actually the words that come from the name of that entity. So we have to realize then that what we're dealing with is we're dealing with, see this word, soter, S-O-T-E-R. This is the word that was originally used for when we said savior, because we have to stop trying to sync English words back 2000 years ago. It, you know, you can keep it in the Greek perspective, but you can't cross it over into things like uh, coiniform and into uh, uh, metuneter. And it's because that's where they cut everyone off from the knowledge. They remove the heretic and demotic scripts, which are the scripts. Okay, I got to go back a little bit. 
So what happens is, is that the rise of this masculine distorted empire starts with Samaria. And it's because that's why the Sumerians are like the, the epitome of the matriarchal civilization empire, right? They even tell you that in, in history books. Oh, they started the first civilization. Now, everyone knows if you're wild, the last thing you hate, the last thing you want to do is be civil. And then you see in the Sumerian paintings them messing with the tree. That's the tree of life. That's the genetics. And you also see them with taming these beasts. Those are the aspects of the zodiacs, also known as the archons, that are the root to the organ systems and things of the physical bodies of all beings of flesh. So what you're witnessing, though, is because uh, Tuns Bruns, he proves this without a doubt. And that's why his books are like $150. Right. He's got two books and it's called uh, uh, Egypt, uh, Ge Geometrica Egyptica, I believe, the geometry of Egypt. And what he goes on to explain is basically the Sumerians hated the, the Kemetans. And what they did was they hated them so much that they didn't want to use their language. So they created this language called coiniform. And this coiniform language, which is set up on a, uh, on a grid of eight by eight. Now, we've heard of that grid before. That's I Ching and that's the chessboard that this grid was actually what they began to construct this language, this new language that they began to develop, which was wedges. These wedges also are synonymous with how to bore into your spirit. That's why they're holding that pine cone up against a tree because they're using wedges in that specific design, which is a concave triangle with a point to borrow into realities or into consciousness, but that may be too deep. So just to keep it on the surface, all the language is doing is recording how many slaves they have, how many kings, the king's power. It records all of most of what we find in the matriarchal tradition of the Bible, the flood story, Gilgamesh. We find every single person, Upnafishtim, Noah. So it shows you that the patriarchal cult actually starts in Samaria because the Sumerians were envious of the Kemetans and the knowledge of Ma'at and the great mother earth, blah, 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 blah. So they created the tradition. They killed Tiamat. Marduk kills Tiamat. So you're seeing the embodiment of the entire story that I'm explaining to you right now between two people, Sumerians and Kemetans. And those two groups today make up the opposite ends of that rainbow. And it seems like to me, though, because I'm not trying to demonize the Sumerians, because to say they were all evil is like saying that all the Kemetans were good. What is, has to happen is same thing that Dynamo Jack had said. You got to learn how to bring these forces together. And it seems like to me that these two forces, just from a aspect of studying history, are the embodiment of the logical and the spiritual. Because without those two components, one can go headlong into error. Meaning that even if you, if you don't have that check and balance system and you're going with the flow, you're probably going to end up in a short period of time in the hands of some evil person. Meaning that you're like, okay, oh yeah, brother, whatever you want to do. Oh yeah, let's say that. Let's sing that. Oh, okay, yeah, let's go there. Okay, let's pray to this. Oh, that's what you want me to do? So if you're just with the flow, which is also a symbol of the divine feminine, if you're just with the flow and you don't have that, wait a minute, but why are we doing this? Which is the symbol of the logical masculine, like I, I need some instructions and I need to know where that came from. Then you can come off balance. You can put yourself into a situation that you're not prepared for. So now fast forwarding, see how I'm I had to explain just the history of the, what was going on with these two back and forth superpowers is the word Soder, which is where I left off, meant savior, okay? So any character like what we call Jesus was known as a Soder. But the interesting thing is when you really study this word, because it also means to deliver, the deliverance, safety, preservation, this is a Soder. But the identity of a Soder was always a demon, the spirit daemon of a cult. Like basically what it's saying is any tradition that came forth always had a focal point, something that they were trying to point everyone to. In Christianity, it's Jesus. In Islam, it's uh, Muhammad. In Buddhism, it's Buddha. In every tradition, there is something that they try to point you to to concentrate all of your power. Yeah. 
And that becomes known as a daemon. And that word does not necessarily mean something positive or something negative, just something you should observe. And because it gets life, because we give it life, that's why even in certain texts and scriptures it says, you gave me life. It says even that God breathed breath into other forms. Who's God if it isn't man <laughs> and woman? We can breathe life into other things. It's even deeper than eidolons, which are like when we think about things really heavy and then an energetic form is created. This is different. This is devotion. This is worship. This is praise. This is honor. This is what they call the sevenfold spirit. The sevenfold spirit is all the things of the greatest character that you can emit from yourself to another. And that's why they call it a devotee. Because when you give all of those essences, which seem to also correspond with your seven organs, correspond with the seven fluids and melatonin, serotonin, et cetera, when you give all of that into something else, it becomes animate because you've given it life, God. So this is what's happening. So then, so the big play is, is that we push our power into something else. It becomes more powerful while we become weaker. And then the more power we push into that, the less power and connection we have with ourselves, which, are, which is our ancestral lineage. And then the less power we have to give to our ancestors, this is like some people always spend more time in these church and these temples than they ever spend at grandma's house, than they ever spend with granddad, ever. Yeah. Even with their own children, they spend more time in the church and praying and on their knees than they spend with their children. And it's because their power is being drained and diverted. But notice how, because I know you two are on to this, so, but notice how all of this is done without the slightest bit of realization that this is what's going on. Likewise, here's another deeper thing that we mentioned during the last conversation, but we can't neglect to mention it during this one. And it's that, so remember, this cult that we're talking about, which makes up these soders or daemons, it's a wand or torch that keeps being passed from one person to another. And this could be Constantine the Great. This could be the immortal Charlemagne. This could be uh, Alexander the Great. And generally, whoever it is has the great behind their name, and they generally want to be served. This could be Jesus, the king of kings. It could be any king or any lord. Generally, anyone who wants to take upon that title. Because in the ancient setting, if you were to become the leader of the tribe, first of all, Generally, there wasn't a leader. What there was were there was elders. <laughs> and you can't actually put elders in the same category as leaders because we see leaders as like the guy who's triumphing with the sword and, gonna, you know, the king and just all the ideology that they give us today versus the role of what we would call leader back in the times, the elders, was to give you knowledge and wisdom, was to nourish you in times of trouble. You don't see that in these kings today. Never do you see when you're stranded or on, in bad luck, any of these folks showing up to talk to you about anything. Yeah. No. So they can't be defined as actual elders. They're surrogates. They're sorcerers. They've usurped the power of most cultures and put themselves into that position, right? So we find that there's quite a few of them, but they all adhere to this one archetypical structure. It's a top-down structure like a pyramid. And when we start to identify them more, and I have to take a break here for just a quick moment. I wanted to take a break at the top hour. But then we start to really unmask what's kind of like behind all of these religions. And I'll bring up this topic before we take a quick break. And this topic really is, is that we now need to look into just one specific scenario about selling a spirit, okay? Because you can never sell the soul. We don't even, you don't have a name. You know, if it hasn't, doesn't have a name, then it hasn't been created. So from that level alone, what exists within all of us can never be pinned down or sold or someone can take it or whatever. Now, somebody can fool you and make you believe that such things could happen, which is a whole different matter. But in truth, the soul cannot be even put into a bottle, can't be identified, okay? But you can sell your spirit, it turns out. And people need to be aware of this because many people are selling their spirits and they just need to cancel those contracts and get their spirit back. Because this happens when they go out and they delve into these different kind of belief systems and these occult structures. And, you know, they, they do things that bind themselves into it more like the rituals and the beliefs and the baptism. All this stuff is designed to tie them in more just to create memories and reference points to where the person 
feels like they can't get out of that structure. So, and generally, the more people are involved in it, then you have the hundredth monkey syndrome working against us. Okay, because we always talk about this hundredth monkey syndrome in consciousness that one day that all of a sudden consciousness is going to start sweeping the land and then we're going to have this hundred monkey syndrome. Right. Mm. But what if if ignorance is sweeping the land and we get a hundred monkey syndrome in ignorance? Mm -hmm. Isn't that just is viable to happen? Yes, it's hundred monkey syndrome is not just exclusive to good things happening, but for a mind that only thinks good, it is. And that's why we have to keep our minds in balance so we can get the other side of the story. Because what the other side of the story shows us is that, okay, let me give you a brief synopsis. So Baphomet actually ended up becoming the, the symbol that they're using today to explain to you this off-balance, matriarchal, herma hermaphroditic freak. And the reason is, is that you understand it is because John, John the Baptist is actually also the embodiment of Baphomet. OK, and this John the Baptist was also Oannes. Oannes was known to be the fish god male who came from the sea and was associated with the Sumerian pantheism. Remember, I told you a while ago because he gets another name in the Sumerian. But I said a while ago that, yeah, remember in Sumerian drawings, you see the guy he's standing up there with the king, as a king and he's got the fish on his back. That's Oannes. Wasn't that the guy that they said that came and taught them all their knowledge? But what kind of knowledge was he teaching? That was the cult right there. That's the cult of the Baptist or the cult of the Baphomet or the one who comes from the, from, that says he comes from the sea, right? He comes from this ocean. He's coming to baptize. So what you start seeing in the metamorphosis of this whole process is that the Knights Templar, okay, so excuse me, one of the main portions of this cult is the relics. See, there's even an ancient saying that says that when we have the relics, we become more powerful. Our cities, meaning our powers, become greater. That's why they put these relics in New York. They put these relics in the Vatican because through these relics, these relics are holding energy of people praying and worshiping them for thousands of years and also the true embodiment of what they really mean, but then it becomes distorted and hacked. So one of the relics was the head of John the Baptist. What you see in the Bible was said to be cut off. See, this was the king that lost his head to the cherubim. And they said that that head, which kind of gives us the mythology of the crystal skulls, had the ability to prophesy. And the reason is, is that any being that begins, in, begins to take in a large amount of light, this is gnosis, they, their pineal gland and their hippocampus and hypothalamus begin to crystallize. It's like what we see in crystals today. So when you're gone, your head becomes like a crystal ball and people can consult with your head so it's sure enough you find in ancient cultures even all the way up until today skulls being consulted for knowledge and information but this one in specific that i'm talking about is the head of oannes now some say it's a crypt it's crypto it's actually not a physical head it's more of the phallus symbol that's why Oh, supposedly Osiris, which is the entry of the dominant male culture into the Egyptian pantheon, doesn't have his genital principle. It's removed. It was cut off. So this is supposedly what they have, and that's why they show all this phallic symbolism around what they do. And in this, they consort with the entity behind the phallus. Okay, so again, it gets into a lot of the male distortion kind of things, which we'll just leave at that. So that was a part of the rites of joining into Knights Templar. So when we look at the Knights Templar, which are the embodiment of all secret societies today, think about it. If you study secret societies, anyone who studies them knows that they have their root in the Knights Templar. And who those Knights Templar were, were the same people that you see that were dominating territories and attempting to become rulers of everything. And they had stooped to sorcery necromancy, dysagy, and syzygy. You have to look up those words to understand what they mean. I don't have the time and space to actually explain them. But when they resorted to that, it's like, again, someone who would do anything for power, they had become under the persuasion of something that had already been cut off long time ago, meaning that 
This thing is just making a comeback. That's why we're experiencing so much turmoil in the world, because back in the day, me and you had already gotten rid of this thing, meaning we had already restored balance and killed the whole idea that there was going to be one that was greater than the other. And what we promised is, is that that would never happen again because it breaks the bridge <laughs> as it's doing now. All this is like layman's terms for us right now. If we just get out of the hole that this is mystical and that, you know, this is got, it has to be, uh, you know, on the spiritual plane, bring it right here, right now. We are under duress and we cannot live in this kind of frequency and reality. And no longer do we want to live with losing our memories, which is our power, because then we will be coming in here on training wheels every single time. And this thing, which is preserving itself lifetime after lifetime, because it stole the knowledge from the book of the dead, will be so many far lengths ahead of us. It will keep whipping us around with stories that we can get into and just dissect and still never get us any further than where we started. Like what's happening today in the conscious community with their most prevalent topics that still have nothing to do with spirituality, but have to do with things that people are doing and creating right now in the world, like the politics and the government. So to continue who the Knights Templar were, where they were these group of sorcerers, they and what they call hermetics. As way they say, it's the hermetic system of the golden dawn. It's not the alchemical system of the golden dawn because those who were her hermetics, and this is not saying anything bad to one who studies hermetics under the guise that it's alchemy because I was one of those people. I thought that hermeticism was the being a hermit and being by yourself basically and studying knowledge and not letting the world get to you. It turns out that it's not. It's actually consecrated to Hearn, the hunter, or Holy Hermes. And when you check the idea of this character, it's Baphomet. That's why in Baphomet's picture, he's holding the rod of Hermes in his lap. Go look at it. Because it's telling you that we have this knowledge of everything about you, your positive side, your negative side, your central side, and that egg on top that we want to eat. It's showing you in their symbolism that they want to dominate us, that they want to take our power and our freedom away. But how can they do such things? Well, we're not talking about a dummy. See, that's the other problem is people think that these beings are ignorant, but we're not. We're functioning on uh, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years of memory. They have all the ancient records. So who's going to be the dummy until we rebuild the bridge? So what happens is, is that what they did was they devised a system that no one would ever know was actually a system that removes their spirit. And we're going to talk about that system right now. Actually, let's talk about it when we come back. That's a good segue, and it allows us to take a brief moment. Let me just you know, clear my mind, go use the restroom really briefly. And then when I, when I come forward, I'm going to finish off in this conversation today. We're going to answer the questions that need to be answered. But with really the greatest revelation, if you may, of the moment of understanding these nice Templar and their religion and also what exactly they were doing that has got us so binded at this point. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> and also how to get out because knowing is half the battle. Remember, I don't talk about any of this stuff if there's not something in this that's going to allow us to break free. Because mm -hmm. other than that, it just goes into the category of, hey, that's just poison. It seems to not have a cure bundled with it. What I'm going to reveal is to let people understand exactly what's going on so they can't be fooled. And then it's a simple mind change. Like what you'll notice is, is that I'm going to mention some things that have been done that have a cause and effect to them. And it makes us feel low and it makes us feel in debt and it makes us feel like we owe somebody something. But that's a system that has been put in place that the moment that we, re re we reveal the fallacy behind that and the falsehood in it, then it dissolves there. There's nothing to go and fill out. There's nothing to change about your name and none of that, that crazy stuff that people have going on right now because the transitions are made first on the spiritual plane, not in the physical. So the moment that you sin from your mind, which is the closest to the spirit, when you sin from your mind, the confirmation of what you're about and what you know, then those changes begin to be made. So let's take about uh, five minutes here, 10 minutes, 
And then when we come forward, I really want to drill into this. And I also want to say thanks for those that are listening. And then I, of course, want to say thanks, for, thanks to Christina and, uh, and, and Stefan, you know, for come, bringing this back around so that we can, you know, reveal this to people. Because, you know, this stuff is like going through a minefield with 100 people behind you. Because you just you're walking over history and then also you're also walking over some very uncomfortable parts of history. Mm. And that's, of course, you know, and to keep another conversation going on. So another pe thing people need to know is that the thalamus is what's really responsible for what we actually see. It can tune out what we call the spiritual world because we don't like to see those figures that are in the spiritual world. Like when you see someone down and out and down on downtown drinking and drugging and you're just looking at them, what do you, uh, what else do you think is going on around them on the spiritual plane? You can only imagine, right? But back in the day, we could see it. And the whole goal of us being able to see it was to get rid of it because we weren't sorcerers. You see, we didn't need something from him. See, people leave the people there because they're like, oh, shit, surely he can't give me anything, so I'm out of here. We don't care that he's being tormented by something that's out of our visual spectrum. But when you have the compassion, that's like, oh, the passion of Christ. They like to try to mix it in, but it's really when you have that compassion, your kundalini is open. And when your kundalini is open, you can see those entities. And when you see those entities, then you put those entities in place, and then that man is truly free. But until then, he remains binded by his own vices and his own minions. Decisions and choices that he made in light has not come to him. But see, that's the bridge. We, that's why even in the highest level of initiation, the book is called The Bridge to the Light. Because what it's trying to emulate is the statement that we bring light to the darkness. We toil in the field the man mainly as the gardener, his creation was in the physical plane to reap the burden of the physical plane. That's why he was made physically stronger so the woman could keep up the, the spiritual plane, right? So the, the man's strength and physical strength is for him to be able to confront those entities that are still needing to be planted again and still need to be nourished again. See, this is not just about kicking some ass. <laughs> this is about and in, in, in destroying or killing something. This is about becoming a man and becoming a woman and being an adept. That's what this whole growth process is. And I wouldn't doubt, I wouldn't doubt for one moment that all of this stuff that I just talked about is happening just so we can do that. I wouldn't put it past the universe because what I saw was so intelligent. I could not and I cannot believe that it's making a mistake. Yeah. <laughs> you see, like it, it's, it's not possible. Mm -hmm. And even within our own existence, we can start when you start to feel yourself, you start to realize that, wait a minute, this is hypersentience. So could it possibly be that I'm interpreting things the wrong way? that all of this stuff is actually happening so that I can wake up. And what I'm waking up to, and I'll explain people the simple process, and I get into it a lot deeper in semester two, but when we are planted here by ourselves, the process is done so that way we can keep the generation of perpetual energy between the, in the system. The cosmos is a perpetual system. So we send a seed when we send a seed, when the seed makes impact, it takes on the mark. The mark is our frequency, our tone, our vibration, or what you would call your name. That remains hidden for a while, meaning you don't have the identity of who you really are yet. And then as you grow up, as long as you grow up with the right fermentations and all the right crucible nature and the pressure and all of the stuff that's needed in this planet, think about it. We got atmospheres, we got pressurization, we got oxygen, we got syzygy. We got synergy. We got all these different things going on just to create the right environment for our growth or our decay. Mm -hmm. Because behold, I saw the ladder coming up and down. I didn't see the ladder just going one way. See, that's the person that just wants to be good. They're like, well, the ladder's only going up. No, the ladder's going down. And the reason also, and the reason why you need that is you need to know you can mess this up. 
you can by sitting on your couch all day or talking about people all day or not thinking that this is serious, totally put yourself into the position of disadvantage to where you're going to need the light to come to you in a while. But while you're in this position to actually begin to shine on your own, you've grown up to that level. Take it all the way. So that's all I'm saying. So we're going to be right back and we're going to finish off about the Knights Templar and their, their temples of their banks. And then we're going to go ahead and close today's conversation. If that's okay. Yep. Awesome. All right, be right back. We all want to see. We all want to be real. And we're searching.